Luke 11, 5 through 13. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are, in be- are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The word of the Lord. I once heard a story about a little girl who grew up in a horrible home. Her parents didn't feed her, clothe her, wash her, care for her. They didn't love her. And that was her reality. Until eventually she was placed in foster care and then adopted it by a family who really did love her and care for her. So that she finally had all the food, clothing, shelter, care, and love that she really needed. She had a new reality. But one day, her parents discovered that she was hoarding food. Every time she would eat a meal, this little girl would take some of the food and she would hide it in her bedroom. When her parents discovered that she was doing this, they asked her why. But because she was so young, she wasn't able to articulate why she was doing this. Now, of course, the parents were able to realize that because of her old reality... This little girl had never known where the next meal was going to come from. So, of course, she was hoarding food. The problem is her old reality was getting getting mapped onto her new reality. In other words, um, she had a distorted picture of parents and family and home and care and provision. And that distorted picture was creating distortions in other areas of her life. The same thing can be true For us, if we have a distorted picture of reality, that distorted picture can create distortions in other areas of our life. And that's especially true when it comes to God. So that if your picture of God is distorted, your whole life will be distorted. Now, how does that change? Well, you need a new picture of God. We're in a series on the parables of Jesus. One of the main things that Jesus is doing in the parables, and especially in this passage we just read, is giving us pictures of God, pictures of who God is and what he's like. And one of the ways he does that sometimes is by giving us distorted pictures and then contrasting those distorted pictures with true pictures of God. Jesus is basically saying, hey, You might think God is like that, but he's not like that. He's really like this. Let me show you who God is. So who is God? What is he like? Well, let's walk through this passage and ask three questions. The questions are, what are some distorted pictures of God? What is a truer picture of God? And how can we live in that picture? Okay? What are some distorted pictures? What's a truer picture of God? And how can we live in that? in that picture. All right, so first, what are some distorted pictures of God? Jesus tells actually two parables in this passage, and each of them is basically a hypothetical question, and the first one goes like this. Say you had a friend come to you at midnight after a long journey, but you didn't have any food to offer your friend. Ah, snap. So what do you do? You go to your neighbor in the middle of the night, and you beg for help, Jesus is asking the question, can you imagine going to your neighbor at midnight in desperate need and your neighbor turns you down? The answer Jesus assumes is is an obvious answer. He just assumes we're all going to say, no, I can't imagine that. 
I can't imagine going to my neighbor and my neighbor says, go away, I'm, I'm asleep, don't bother me, I can't help you. No, of course my neighbor is going to help me. The, basically, that's all that's really going on in this parable. Now, the standard interpretation of this parable is that Jesus is teaching us to be persistent in prayer. And a lot of this really comes down to verse 8. Now, in this verse, you'll notice that it's all impersonal pronouns. There are no proper nouns. So just remember, there are two main characters in this parable. One of them is the guy at the door. We'll call him the knocker. The other one is the guy in bed. We'll call him the sleeper. Okay? Here's what Jesus is saying. I tell you, though he, the sleeper, will not get up and give the knocker anything because he is his friend, yet because of the knocker's impudence, the sleeper will rise and give him whatever he needs. Now, the really key word here is this word impudence. Most translations, or many translations, translate that word persistence, and they say that the, the big idea in this parable is that if you're knocking on God's door in prayer, and God says no, that if you just keep praying persistently enough, then you can get God to turn his no into a yes. There are two problems with that interpretation. And the first one is this. This word impudence does not mean persistence. Persistence is a, is a positive word to us. It's, it, that's a virtuous word. But this is not a virtuous word. This is a word that literally means shameless, outrageous, offensive behavior. It's the kind of stuff we say, can you believe the nerve of that person pulling a stunt like that? This word is referring to socially inappropriate behavior. It's not a virtue. Second, there's no need to keep knocking because the whole point of this parable is that God would never turn you down in the first place. Jesus, that's basically what's going on here. The very first thing Jesus is saying is that God is not the kind of God who would ever turn you down in the first place. That's what's going on here. Um, and so as a result of that, we can sometimes have distorted pictures of God because what Jesus is saying is, is God would never turn you down. It, it's not a word that means persistence. It means socially inappropriate behavior. But no matter how socially inappropriate it is, God is the kind of God who's always going to answer your need for prayer. That's what Jesus is saying here. Now, here's the point. Sometimes it's easy for us to have these um, distorted pictures of God. And one of the distortions is this. We read a prayer like this or a parable like this, and we understand that sometimes we can have a picture of God as cold, uncaring, and cruel. A, a, a picture of God that says God doesn't really care about us. He doesn't really care about the world. So why would I worship a God like that? For instance, in my office, I have a, um, a copy, a framed copy of the front page of the New York Times from September 12th, 2001. I had moved to New York City six weeks before 9-11, and as a result, I just happened to have a copy of the newspaper from the following day. Years later, when I moved here to St. Louis, I took that newspaper to a frame store because it was starting to age and get yellow, and I wanted to preserve it. So I took it in there, and when I went to pick it up, I'll never forget the day I went back to get it, the gentleman who brought it out to me, he brought out the framed um, copy of the paper. He looked at it with this big picture of the Twin Towers burning, and as he handed it to me, he said, God was asleep that day. It's sometimes it's easy for us to have this picture of a God who says, I'm asleep now. Don't bother me with, my, with your needs. Jesus is saying it's understandable sometimes that we might have a picture of God like that. And it's not just because of the evil that happens in this world. Sometimes it's because of the evil that's in the church that we have this distorted picture of God. So, for instance, Martin Luther King uh, once preached a sermon during the Civil Rights Movement on this parable, and it's called A Knock at Midnight. In the sermon, he compares the racism of our country to the darkness of midnight. And he says many people are knocking on the door of the church, pleading with the church to do something about it. In fact, today is Juneteenth. It's the day that we celebrate June 19th, 1865, when the emancipation finally reached enslaved African Americans in the state of Texas. And yet here's Martin Luther King, a hundred years later, 
And he's still having to fight this fight to lead his people into freedom. And as a result of that, in this sermon, Martin Luther King said this. He said, one of the shameful tragedies of history is that the very institution that should remove people from the midnight of racial segregation, he's talking about the church, he said that institution participates in creating and perpetuating the midnight. Martin Luther King had firsthand experience with white church leaders who refused to get involved in the fight for racial justice. Today, many people have this picture of a God who doesn't care about justice in this world because they see people who claim to represent that God that don't appear to claim to care about justice in this world. Now listen, it's important to say that the reason people have this picture of God is because they do care deeply about justice and they don't see it happening in this world. So it's understandable that people would have this kind of picture about God. But Jesus is saying that's a distorted picture. And there are other distorted pictures in this passage. So if you look at the second parable, remember, it's a um, hypothetical questions that Jesus is, is asking us here. In the second parable, Jesus is essentially asking us, hey, if you're a parent, can you imagine your child coming to you and asking for a fish or an egg, and you instead would give them a scorpion or a serpent? And again, the, the obvious answer is, no, I can't imagine that. What's Jesus doing? He's pointing out some distorted pictures that we might have of God. And there are actually a couple of possible distortions in this picture. And one of them is this. Sometimes it's possible for us to have a picture of God, of a God who tricks us. A God who, who gets you to worship him, but then he pulls out the rug from underneath you. Have you ever felt like that? You're praying for something that, that is really important to you, but then instead of that, something really bad happens, and you feel like, well, that's what I get for trusting in God. I'm never going to let that happen again. Jesus is saying it's understandable. Sometimes you're going to feel that way about God. Another potential distortion is this. Um, sometimes we feel like it's selfish and self-centered of us to pray for what feels to us like small, petty needs. One part of the distortion is that we feel like we should be more virtuous. We should be more humble and noble, and um, we should be more spiritual. And another part of the picture is that, well, God is transcendent. God is high and holy. And so for us to ask for our own selfish, petty needs, that's demeaning to God, and it's demeaning to us. It's like a lower form of spirituality. Friends, here's the point. Jesus is affirming our sacred longings for things like justice, kindness, compassion, love, and virtue. He's, but he's also acknowledging that there are reasons that when we see the absence of those things, that there are reasons that we might be led to doubt in a loving, personal God. He's affirming um, um, the reasons we might have that picture of God, but he's also challenging us that these are distorted pictures of God. He's saying, hey, you think God is like that, but he's not. He's really like this. Let me show you who he really is. And that leads to our next point. We've just seen what are some distorted pictures of God, but next Jesus gets us to ask, what is a truer picture? What's a truer picture of God? Well, let's go back to this first parable about the guy knocking on the door at midnight. Remember, one of the main things Jesus is showing us is that it's all about this reality that God will always respond to your requests for prayers. But one of the other big things Jesus is showing us here is that that means that you can come to God anytime, any place with your prayers. That you could actually, you should come to God with risky prayers. In fact, that you can come and, and you should come to God with prayers that feel outrageous, shameless, and borderline inappropriate to you. What do I mean? You know, um, some parables are harder to understand than others. And this parable about the knock at midnight is one of those parables. There are actually a few interpretations of this parable throughout history. And man, they all make really good points. Sometimes it's hard to know what's the right interpretation. So I want you to know that I was actually working extra hard for you this week, reading and studying and, and wrestling and praying a lot, like because I went back and forth on, on this a few times. I've typically believed one interpretation, but I was like this week as I studied more, I was like, I'm not so sure about this. So let me tell you the interpretation that I think is really right, right and also why I think that's the right 
interpretation. And, and again, it all comes back to verse 8, that verse we looked at a bit. Remember, uh, there's two characters, the sleeper and the knocker. So Jesus says, I tell you, though the sleeper will not get up and give the knocker anything because he is his friend, yet because of the knocker's impudence, the sleeper will rise and give him whatever he needs. Now, I already told you that this word impudence is often translated persistence, but that's not the right translation. That's not what the word means. And I also told you, you know, why not only I think that's the wrong interpretation, but let me tell you also that um, today most modern scholars and commentators are pretty well agreed that this word doesn't mean persistence. But there are a couple of other really viable interpretations of this, and one of them goes like this. Some scholars say that this word impudence is actually not referring to the guy knocking at the door, that it's actually referring to the guy in bed. That the word literally means shamelessness. And the idea is that the guy in bed is wanting, he has a desire to avoid shame. Here's why. The idea is that, first of all, this is a shame on our culture. And hospitality is a really big deal in a culture like that. So the honor of not just the guy in bed, but really the honor of the whole village depends on the guy in bed getting up and making sure that he helps his neighbor provide for the needs of this visitor to their village. It's a desire to avoid shame. Now, it's true, this is a shame on our culture. It's also true that hospitality is a really big deal in that culture. And I really do think that this is one of the main reasons that everybody in Jesus' original audience would have said, no, we can't imagine anybody turning down a request like this. But here's the problem. Again, this word does not mean a desire to avoid shame. It's not a virtuous word. It's a negative word. It means shameless, offensive, outrageous uh, behavior. It means socially inappropriate behavior. And that's why I think that this word is actually talking about the guy who's knocking on the door because he's the one who's engaging in the socially inappropriate behavior. I mean, imagine the picture. Here he is. It's the middle of the night. And I know for us, midnight, maybe we're just starting to go to bed at midnight. But for villages like this, I mean, they've been asleep for hours by this time. When you go to bed when it gets dark, midnight's the middle of the night. So here's this guy. He comes banging on the door. It doesn't actually say he was knocking. He may, maybe he was banging on the door. Maybe he was yelling out front. But whatever he's doing, he is not just waking up the guy in bed and his whole family. He's potentially waking up the whole village be because these villages were really closely packed. It's very possible he was waking up the whole village so that all the neighbors would have been saying, can you imagine the nerve of this guy? He's the one engaged in the socially inappropriate behavior. Friends, not only is Jesus telling us that God will always respond to your prayers, I think one of the other big things that Jesus is telling us here is he's saying, so you should always go to God anytime with any prayer. Go to God with risk. You feel like it's shameless and inappropriate and outrageous. Go to God with your prayers. Bother God in prayer. Now listen, I could be wrong. Maybe one of the other interpretations is right. But the, based on the study and the reading of the parable, I think that's the right interpretation. And one of the other big reasons I think that's the right way of reading this is because when you look at the Bible, you see God responding to that kind of prayer. So for instance, in Genesis 18, God goes to Abraham, the father of the faith, and he says, Abraham, I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah because there's great wickedness in that city. And Abraham starts praying. He actually starts pestering God. He says, God, yeah, what if there's 50 righteous people in that city? Uh, far be it from you, God, far be it from you to destroy a city if there's 50 righteous people in that city. You know, Abraham is not being meek and obsequious. He's being shameless. He's being bold. He's being outrageous here. He's, he's the nerve of that guy to talk to God like that. But here's God, and God says, Abraham, if there's 50 righteous people in that city, I'll spare the city. Abraham keeps going. He says, God, I know I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. Go back and read it. You can see Abraham knows that he is right on the boundaries of socially inappropriate behavior with God here. And yet he keeps going. God, what if there's only 45 righteous what if there's only 40? 
What if there's only 30 or 20 or 10? What if there's only 10 righteous people, God? And every single time, no matter how shameless or outrageous Abraham is, God responds to his prayer every single time. And it's not just the Old Testament. If you look at the ministry of Jesus, you see people praying to Jesus this way and Jesus responding. So for instance, in Mark chapter 10, um, right at the end of his life, uh, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem where he's going to be crucified. So you, you think, okay, Jesus has some important things to do here. He's leaving the city of Jericho. And there's a blind guy named Bartimaeus who hears that Jesus is going by. And he starts crying out, son of David, have mercy on me. He's just crying out. And you can see in the passage that all the other people in the crowd know that this is socially inappropriate behavior because they tell him, hey, dude, shut up. Pipe down. Jesus is walking by right now. They're telling him to pipe down, but he keeps crying out, son of David, have mercy on me. He's engaging in socially inappropriate behavior. And yet here's Jesus who has, you know, one or two other important things going on at the time. Jesus goes over to the guy and says, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus says, Lord, I want to see. And Jesus heals him. Friends, every single time God responds to prayers like this. And Jesus is saying, not only will God always respond to your prayers, but you come to God boldly. You come shamelessly, audaciously, outrageously. Even if you think it's borderline inappropriate, go to God in prayer. That is one of the main things that's going on here. But here's the question. How can we come to this high and holy God, this transcendent God, with our selfish, petty prayer needs and trust that God's really going to answer us? Because isn't it really selfish and petty of us to come to God with needs like this? Well, that leads to our last point. We've seen what are some distorted pictures of God. Uh, we've just seen what is a truer picture of God. But lastly, how can we live in that picture of God? Well, here's how. Remember, it's all... Back in this first parable, if we look at it once again, remember Jesus is saying, yes, God will always respond to your prayers. But he's also saying, so you should go to God shamelessly and boldly and, and audaciously in prayer. Borderline inappropriate. Now, the key here, though, is to remember that um, there really is a tension here. I mean, there really is a tension between us coming to God with needs that are potentially selfish and petty to us, but this transcendent, high, and holy God, how do you fit both of these two things together? Jeff was just talking about this in our time of confession. You know, this passage we just read is really part of a, a larger section in the Gospel of Luke that begins with Jesus' disciples coming to Jesus and saying, Lord, teach us to pray. And, and so what Jesus does is he teaches them what we call the Lord's Prayer, which begins like this, Father, hallowed be your name. Jesus is saying, when you come to God, when you approach God, you do approach with reverence and awe and worship. This is a high and holy God. You approach this God. You bow down before the glory of God. But then right after this, Jesus tells a parable, which makes it sound like when you come to God, you come outrageous. You come shameless. You come borderline inappropriate behavior. So we want to ask Jesus, which is it? One of the people that has helped me think most clearly about this is the great preacher and writer in New York City, Pastor Tim Keller. By the way, if, um, if you know about him, you may know that he's been struggling with cancer for the past few years. Um, my understanding is that this last week he was actually in the hospital with some complications. I think he's home now, but he's got some long medical road in front of him. So if you happen to think about Pastor Keller, do please pray for him. But, uh, but he really helps us think about this. He says, he gives us a thought experiment by saying, hey, um, who gets to go to the um, president of the United States and make requests? You just march into the White House. You just march into the Oval Office and start making demands and saying, here's what I want. No. Who gets to see the president of the United States and make a request? How do you get in there? Well, first, you got to have some credentials. You need to be somebody important. There's got to be a good reason for you to be there. Second, you need to have an invitation. The Oval Office does not accept walk-ins. And thirdly, if you do manage to get in there, you darn well better show some respect while you're there. Now, that's just the Oval Office. What about if the president is in bed in the middle of the night? Who gets to march up to the president's bedside, wake him up and say, give me what I want? The answer is 
nobody. If you tried to pull a stunt like that, you'd be shot before you got anywhere near. Nobody gets to do that except his child. Daddy, I'm thirsty. Will you get me a drink of water? What's the president going to do? He's going to haul himself out of bed and get his kid a drink of water. Friends, you put all this together, and, and here's what Jesus is saying to us, that what's outrageous from anyone else, God welcomes from a child. What's, what we consider to be outrageous and inappropriate behavior from anyone else, God actually welcomes that from his children. I mean, imagine if you found out one morning that your little child had been thirsty all night long and you asked them, well, why didn't you come and ask me for a drink? If your child said, well, I was afraid because I thought I would be bothering you. If your kid said that to you, you would be torn up. What's outrageous from anyone else, God welcomes from a child. So how do you come to God in prayer? Like a child. That's exactly what Jesus is showing us in the second parable of this passage. Remember, he's asking the question, hey, if you're a parent, can you imagine your child coming to you asking for a fish or an egg, but instead you would give them a scorpion or a serpent? And the obvious answer is no, I can't imagine that. Jesus is saying that if you come into a relationship with God through him, that you become a son or a daughter of God. That means on the one hand, do you come with reverence and awe and worship? Of course you do. Even little kids, you know, they don't go up to the bedside of their parent and say, hey, bub, hey, pal, how about a drink of water over here? No, of course not. There's respect, there's dignity, there's honor. But little kids, especially, if you think about really little kids, when they need something, they don't hem and haw. They're just direct. What do they do? They poke, they prod, they tug, they pull, they cry out. They're not worried about social decorum. They're not aware of social propriety. They just ask for what they need. Jesus is saying that there's a sense in which no matter how spiritually mature you come, that when you approach God in prayer, there's a childlikeness about your approach to God, that there, there should be a shamelessness and even an outrageousness about the way you approach God in prayer, that you can come to God in the middle of the night and bother him in prayer because he's a father. He likes to be prayed to like that. He likes it when you ask him like that. That's what Jesus is saying here. And by the way, this really helps us with that problem we were mentioning just a bit ago. Sometimes we feel like it's selfish and self-centered of us to come to God with prayer requests that we feel are really petty and small. I mean, if God says, hey, go ahead and ask me for whatever you want, isn't there a danger that we would abuse a privilege like that? Yeah, there is. That's why at the very end, notice what Jesus says. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Jesus is saying what we really need is the Holy Spirit. That the more you grow in a relationship with God, the more spiritually mature you become, the more you learn how to ask not just for what you want, but for what you really need. He's saying, if you really engage in a life of prayer like that, that God is going to give you the growth and the maturity that you need through his Holy Spirit. And that means that sometimes um, you'll ask for things in prayer that you think it's a fish or an egg, and unaware to you, you, you actually what you're asking for is a scorpion or a serpent. You just don't realize it. And of course, God is not going to give that to you in prayer. He's not going to give you something that's harmful to you. You know, like, Mommy, Daddy, can I drink some of that purple stuff under the sink? Your parent knows, like, you know, you think you're asking for Kool-Aid, but what you're really asking for is drain cleaner. I'm not going to give that to you. How about I give you a drink of water? Friends, God will always give you what you really need, not just what you think you need. He'll always give you what you really need. So is there a danger that we might ask selfishly and self-centeredly? Of course there is, because we are selfish. We are self-centered. You notice um, what Jesus said at the end, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts. Jesus just assumes that every single one of us has moral and spiritual decay in our hearts that needs to be healed. And yet he's saying that 
that as you grow in maturity with God, as you grow in a relationship with God, that you are going to learn to ask not just for what you think you need, but for what you really need. And the way we can be confident that God will always answer a prayer like that for us is because Jesus Christ is the true Son of God who went to his Father in the middle of the night with a desperate request. On the night before Jesus was nailed to the cross, Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was bothering God in prayer. Jesus prayed, Father, is there any way for me to save the world without going to the cross? That's what Jesus wanted. And yet, Jesus wasn't just praying for what he wanted. He was praying for what we needed. And what we need most desperately, what we need more than anything else in the world, was for someone to come and rescue us from the evil of our own hearts and bring healing and renewal to the whole world. So Jesus didn't just pray for what he wanted. He prayed, Father, not my will be done, but but thy will be done. Do you realize what that means? Friends, on the cross, Jesus got a snake so we could get a fish. Jesus got the justice that we deserve so that we could get the love and the acceptance and the blessing that he deserves. That means that we become sons and daughters of God on Jesus' coattails. In other words, God's love doesn't come into our lives on the basis of our moral credentials or our spiritual performance or our lack of credentials and performance. God's love doesn't come into our lives on the basis of how hard we work or how well we behave or how well we don't behave. It doesn't depend on us or anything we do. It depends on Jesus, on who he is and what he did for us on the cross. That means that That when we pray, we can be confident that God will respond to our prayers, and we can also pray shamelessly, boldly, and outrageously, knowing that God loves to answer prayers like that from his children. He loves it when you ask him like that. You know, there's a place in the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis uh, where Aslan the lion, who's really Jesus, he sends two children named Diggory and Polly on a mission. And along with them, he sends a talking horse named Fledge. So Diggory, Polly, and Fledge go off on this mission, but along the way they get hungry. Diggory starts complaining, why didn't anybody arrange for our meals? Meanwhile, Fledge is over there munching on some grass, but he puts his head up and he says, well, I'm sure Aslan would have arranged if you had asked him. And Polly very sensibly says, well, wouldn't he know without being asked? To which Fledge says, well... I've no doubt he would, but I've sort of an idea he likes to be asked. Friends, God likes it when you ask. He likes it when you bother him in prayer. So if you're exploring faith, you realize Jesus is issuing you a wide open invitation. As he said in this passage, ask, seek, knock. That is a prayer request God will always answer. So if you really want to know who God is, but, but you're also willing maybe to be challenged, to have the evil in your heart confronted, and also to have the pictures you might have of God that are distorted, to have those pictures challenged, that is a prayer request God will always answer. He will always answer a prayer like that. And if you are a follower of Jesus, lean into a life of prayer. Lean into it. Yes, I mean, that's not the only way you grow in God and experience God, but you will not grow fully in God. You will not experience God as fully as you are meant to without a deep life of prayer. God likes it when you ask, so go to him in prayer. He will always respond to your requests. He wants you to ask him shamelessly, boldly, audaciously, outrageously. Ask God for what you need. Ask him for the Holy Spirit. Bother God in prayer. Because this is a God who loves to answer the the requests of his children. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can call you Father through our Savior Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross and got a snake so we could get a fish. We thank you for loving us so much that you have ushered us into a relationship with your Father so that we could be called sons and daughters of God. We pray this morning, Lord, that you would um, heal the distorted pictures of you that we have in our hearts and our lives. Lord, we need healing from distorted pictures. We thank you that you understand the reasons we have these pictures, but we also pray, Lord, this morning, that wherever we're at in our faith journey with you, whether we're 
have been following you for years or whether we're just beginning to um, wonder who you might really be, that you would help us to see more clearly and more truly who you really are. Lord, heal the distortions in our lives. Heal our distorted um, relationship with you. Heal us that we might become a clearer, truer picture of who you are to the world around us. For we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.